is the last man standing at the bar. I'll drive the giant. Good man. Uh, do you know, this is probably a good time because I've already written this somewhere else. Uh, Andre the Giant, do you, do you remember the first time you met him? Yes, sir, I most certainly do. Andre was a good friend of mine. I, uh, you know, I started wrestling in Tennessee. Well, we Everybody was based out of Nashville because we do Memphis was this way and Louisville was that way. So most of the most of the guys in the territory lived in Nashville. So, uh, anyway, I was going to tell you a quick story to get to that. Jerry, know, Jerry, brought me, Jerry Jarrett brought me into business. I started Tupelo, Mississippi, and then so I started making the loop, you know. So I hadn't been, you know, I hadn't been working six months probably, and I just bought that other. You know, I seen all them driving them Lincolns and Cadillacs, and I said, oh, yeah, baby. But uh, – First car I had was old 73 LTD, and then and then I bought me that 76 Oldsmobile Regency. It, it was long like a Cadillac, but it wasn't a Cadillac. But anyway, Andre was dressing in Louisville, Kentucky, and so they asked me would I give Andre a ride back to Nashville. And I, how, how can I – nobody liked to take him because they said he broke their seats, you know, and uh, – so I said, I don't care if he rides with me or not. And so anyway, so the match over, and he had just got here too, so he didn't speak a little, little English. He had a, a translator, Frenchy, with him. And uh, he was at the hotel because they'd had a long flight or something. Me and Andre get in my read, see, well, we go over the holiday inn, and it's got like a little horseshoe drive, and it's got a little concrete curb sitting up on it. And that, that race is a little longer than what I was used to. I wheeled that thing in. And on Andre's side, the tires run up on the curb. That car went oh, boom, yeah, boom. And, of course, with as heavy as he was, it come down hard. I was, I was holding that steering wheel. I thought, oh, God, I hope you don't slap me. I hope you don't slap me. You know, but he's that I am. So we get preaching, though. And this, this is the most stands out in my mind about it. I mean, Andre was as good a guy. I mean, I never met as nice a person as him. And uh, I hate, you know, it's one thing he wrestled. And he, he was a freak of nature. But just people are cruel sometimes. You know, they say shit that they shouldn't even be said, you know. And because he was just the nicest man I ever met. So anyway, we get, we get Frenchy and uh, he said, beer, beer. He knew beer and balls. <laughs> beer, ball. beer balls and back then I wasn't but 18 I said and I drank like even a little 7 ounce Miller's they ate the late packs of them I said I said yeah I'll take an 8 pack of them little pony Miller's right so him and Frenchy come in go in I stayed in the car when they come out they both got two big boxes with them they bought me Six eight packs of beer. I said, No, no, I said, We won't never make home. Give me an eight pack, put the rest in the trunk. But Andre had bought him a case of quart bottle beer. So it was like his hand holding that quart looked like me holding that seven. I mean, he was just a huge man. My wife, he hurt his ring, it would fit on three of her fingers, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Rick Martell? Of course, yeah. Well, so after all of that, after that, I went to Atlanta. Well, me and Rick teamed up in Atlanta as tag team. You know, we won the belts, as a matter of fact. But anyway, anytime Andre come in, we was who he wanted to go with. Of course, Ricky knew him, French Canadian, and I took him in Louisville, you know, and so he and he liked me. Uh, you know, I don't know how we didn't have much conversation, but anyway, he liked me, I guess. Because anytime he come in, he wanted us. And we would hate for him. I mean, we'd love to see him, but we'd hate for him to come. Because as soon as the matches were over, it was bar time. <laughs> and and he could drink, but but what would happen, he he wouldn't really add y'all, but you know, you drink make me one of them. See, anyway, one night, it was a Sunday night at the Army. You know, during the week, everything closed at 3. On Sunday, it closed at 12. 
Well, me and Rick and Bob, we hugging each other. Said, man, 12 o'clock, if we can just hang on to then, we ain't going to be sick or nothing. And uh, so anyway, 12 o'clock hit, and uh, Andre come up and he said, no, we went up to him and said, you had to go, boss? He said, yeah, he said, maybe, maybe we go after I was bar down. And I lived in Atlanta for a year and a half too. You didn't have nothing about no after hours bar now. <laughs> Andre come in and out of here and he knew where everything in the world was. So here we go. And it, like we ran the Omni that night. We always supposed to dry, dress nice, you know, for the Omni. So that day I went and bought me a $150, like a pantsuit, you know, back powder blue, you know, uh, thought I slick. So anyway, we say, yeah, we'll go down there with you. So we get to the bar down there. And I walk up to the bar, me and Ricky with him. He said, what do you want to drink? And I drink, every now and then I drink some vodka and grapefruit. And that was a bad night to do it. But anyway, the guy, he made me one. I just turned it up and killed it. I said, fuck on, dry. I said, hey, ain't nothing in that drink. He said, he's a bartender. And say that's the dumbest thing I can say. Because the next time wasn't no grapefruit in it. So I still <laughs> had to drink it anyway. So at three o'clock, like as you, it, but when you come in the door, there was a, like a bench this way and a bench this way. So we went in. So, and I, I hadn't seen Ricky in a while. I didn't know where he was. But about three o'clock, they started cooking breakfast. And I was told up. You know how food smells sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, that's cooking bacon. All the people ordered bacon and all that stuff. I sit there. I said, mm-hmm. So I jumped up and I run to the bathroom. Well, they had the little pee thing, and then they had the stall. I put the stall was locked. Somebody was in there. So I, was, I went right to the little train, man. I'm all like. Eh. <laughs> All of a sudden, I hear somebody in there doing the same damn thing. Come to find out, it was Ricky Martell. He was in there sick. He done got sick, too. So we went out. I was laying on one of the male shape one of the bitches, and Ricky was laying on the other one. Andre, now, he sat in there and ate his breakfast and everything. And people was coming in. They'd say, look, there's Tommy Rich and Rick Martell. <laughs> so, so finally, Andre comes out. He picks Ricky up in one arm and me in the other. And, uh, and I didn't even know he could drive. Ricky, Ricky had a 73 LT uh, Thunderbird, 73 Thunderbird then. And anyway, he put us put Ricky in the pass. I got in the back. Ricky got in the pass side. And, of course, I don't know how he drove, but he did. So, But anyway, as we're going back, I done throwed up all I could. But you know how you get them dry heaves? Mm-hmm. Well, in that, on that 73 Thunderbird, it'll hand up a little smoke window. You know, it didn't open about that far, so you couldn't get your head out. <laughs> so I had to take my new $150 suit jacket, and I was dry heaving in it. Yeah, oh, I was sick and a dog. Got up the next day. I was going to take it and clean it. I said, throw it in the trash. I was <laughs> mad. I was mad at Andre. I said, son of a gun, he gets us every single time. That's the problem he, when he's always I mean, picking he, up the tab as well, isn't it? When somebody else is picking up the tab, oh, yeah, the drinks yeah. go down quicker. Yeah. Oh, but it, he he would he he wouldn't make you drink, but he'd make you feel like you needed to drink. Yeah. With, you know, come on, boss. You know, and you say, okay, but hell, he could drink probably. Uh, you know, ain't no telling how much Andre could drink on a good day when he wanted to. 